This is the question called rows uh, and in respect of rows what we're going to do initially is we're going to do the written part of the question which is part A and then we're going to turn our attention to the calculation of the group SFP. So the first thing we're asked to do in part A of the question is to determine and discuss and apply the principles set out in IAS 21 in order to determine the functional currency. I'm going to split the question into two. We're going to look at the theory in first and the first thing we can say well functional currencies are related to some broad issues the first of which is in relation to sales prices and the important thing when you're dealing with a question of this nature is to break the written part of your answer down into as many smaller components as you can and deal with them in bite-sized chunks. So the first thing that we've got is the fact that we've got sales prices which are being determined in dinars. And because they're determined in dinars, that's the, the local currency of STEM and therefore this is indicative that dinars potentially are going to be the functional currency of SEM. So we say if these are set out in the local currency then it gives us evidence that this should be used as the functional currency. So I'm picking this up from note B where it says the income of STEM is denominated and settled in dinars and also the fact that the output of the mine is traded in dinars and its price is determined by local supply and demand. The more local issues you have the more likely the local currency is to be the functional currency. So we've looked at income and we then turn our attention to costs and expenses. And if the costs of the business, and we look at sort of operational costs, such as day-to-day -day running expenses, but also finance costs. How, how have we borrowed money? Have we borrowed money from the parent company or have we borrowed money from local banks? So here we appear to have borrowed money from local banks. So these are all determined locally which again is evidence that we should be using this as the functional currency. However, it also says that 40% of our costs and expenses are in dollars. So we're not really able to make much of a conclusion in respect of expenses. So let's turn our attention to something else. And we're also got information about regulations and rules and how decisions are being made. The more decisions which are being made locally and the more rules we have to apply locally, the more likely it is that the dinar is going to be our functional currency. Now the question says that rows or that uh, STEMS management have degree of authority and autonomy. So when we come to apply these rules we're going to use uh, this as our method of determining whether we've got a functional currency as dollars or dinars. So I've said here if the company has to follow rules then this is further evidence of it being the functional currency. So that's my broad application of the standard itself. But now let's apply things specifically to the position of STEM. So here I'm going to have a separate section and the reason why I do this is that if I see the word and in a question it says discuss and apply I immediately think of splitting the question into two smaller parts. So we've done the discussion now we're going to do the application in respect of STEM. So first of all in terms of income well we know that income has been settled using dinars so this is indication that dinars are potentially 
our functional currency. So we looked at our first test. Next we turn our attention to expenses. And here we've got the problem that we can't really reach a conclusion as far as STEM is concerned. And because we've got this split, I'd say that there's, there's evidence to support both the dollar and the dinar being the functional currency. So we can't really reach a conclusion here. Notice I've tried to apply my general rules when dealing with written questions. And that general rule is I try to summarize things effectively in a bullet point style and in two lines, two and a half lines max. So thirdly, we've got uh, decision making and local management appear to be in charge of STEM. It doesn't appear to be an extended branch of Rose, which is the parent company. And as a consequence, this is further evidence that we should be using the DINAR as our functional currency. So taking all of these things together, the conclusion I would reach is that probably the DINAR is the functional currency of STEM. So you've got to look at everything in aggregate. There's no point just looking at one particular point. And we've also got the fact that STEM is borrowing money from local banks. So putting all these things together, whilst the evidence is not conclusive, the weight of evidence supports using the DINAR as the functional currency. So to summarize what we've done here, we've effectively got seven or eight points which we've laid out. I've tried to use my two line rule and I've tried to keep one idea per point in order to make it easier to mark. Now we're going to turn our attention to the preparation of our group financial statement. I've set out a pro forma. I've added in lines for intangibles because we've spotted we've got some intangibles here. I've added in an extra line for goodwill. And then when it comes to the bottom half of our statement of financial position, I've also slotted in a line for the non-controlling interest as well. So this is what you'd normally expect to do in a question and mentally I would also be looking at the main issues that we see arising as far as the question is concerned and making references to individual items which are going to be adjusted. So we need to start off with our group structure. Rose initially has 70% of petal it then buys a further 10%, but notice that that further 10% purchase is on the last day of the year, which means that we're not going to have to split out the profits 80-20 for any period of time. As far as STEM is concerned, the group owns 52% of STEM, so therefore the NCI have the remainder, which is 48%. Our other workings are our standard workings, so we'll have a net assets working, goodwill, NCI and reserves as well. The way I'm going to approach this is I'm going to add together all of my dollar assets. So I'm going to do that for rose and petal. 
And as far as STEM is concerned, I'm going to translate all of the assets and the liabilities using the closing rate of exchange. Next, we've got our investments in the two subsidiaries. So as far as Petal is concerned, because that's in dollars, I'm going to stick in the initial figure of 113. And for STEM, we've got the cost of STEM at the acquisition date. There's not been any adjustments yet in respect of exchange rate movements. Next item, financial assets, 22 for rose and petal, and then 50, and I'm going to divide that by the closing exchange rate of 5. I've not cross-referenced this to anything, so therefore I'm feeling reasonably confident I can stick in a grand total of 32. We've then got current assets. Again, add together rose and petal as they're in the same currency. And as far as STEM is concerned, put in the figure for STEM, it, current assets aren't referenced to anything, so we're in a position to simply work out a total by dividing by the closing rate of exchange. Share capital. Well, we use the share capital of the parent company in our group statement of financial position, and we slot that straight in. For our two subsidiaries, share capital goes into net assets. Of course, we're going to have those calculations done at both of our key dates. But sh we always assume, of course, that share capital does not change. So for Petal, it's 38 million at both dates, and for STEM, it's 200 at both dates. Next, we've got our retained earnings. And for the parent company, they go straight into our group reserves total working number five. So those are figures of 256 and seven, respectively. We have to do the same for our investments, for our subsidiaries. So we're going to move up to working number two. And slot in those numbers. So this is literally cutting and pasting from the question into our workings. Put in separate rows for retained earnings and OCE. There isn't any OCE for STEM, but remember that STEM's figures are being shown in dinars, whereas Petal's figures are being shown in dollars. Non-current liabilities are next. Now I've noticed that we have a potential adjustment to non-current liabilities, so I'm not going to put this in as a total, but I've not referenced current liabilities to anything. So therefore, I'm going to gamble and put in a total for current liabilities of 282. We've therefore now dealt with all of the figures in the statement of financial position itself. So let's take a look at note number one, note or note A. And it's telling us that we acquired 70% of Petal initially, and the purchase consideration was 94 million. Well, this is different, isn't it, to the figure that we've picked out from our statement of financial position. So therefore, I'm going to go down to my goodwill working and I'm going to take away the cost of the extra 10%, and the cost of that extra 10% was 19 million. 
and I'm going to put that extra 19 million into our calculation of the adjustment that when we make that second acquisition. So I'm going to open up an extra working, I'm going to call that working number six. The increased investment in Petal and I'm simply going to go credit cost of investment 19 million. And I'm going to go no further with that, but let's take a look at the next items that we have. And we're told that the fair value of the net assets of Petal are 120 million, so let's slot that in, but that Petal also has a patent or a patent worth 4 million. So, and that is in addition to the fair value of 120. So therefore I'm going to add an extra 4 million onto my fair value total and because the patent is an intangible fixed asset I'm going to set up a separate line on the face of my statement of financial position to the value of 4 million. Now we're told that that patent has four years remaining as a consequence we're going to have to amortize it over that four year period which is 1 million, which gives us an intangible total of 3 million. That amortization also has to be deducted from the profits of Petal, so go down to working number 2 and deduct our amortization of 1 million. We then told the retained earnings and OCE totals in respect of Petal, so it's a case of slotting those in. And in theory they should all add up to 120 million, but they don't. And the reason for this is that we've got a further fair value adjustment and we work that out as a balancing figure. So if we add together 38, 49 and 3, it gives us a grand total of 3 million. So I'll simply slot that in and we've got 30 million as a balance and because it's in relation to land there's no further adjustments to make in terms of depreciation but of course we've got to increase PPE by 30 million as well. So we've dealt with all of that and because we're using the full goodwill method we can put in our NCI into both the goodwill calculation and our NCI calculation. Moving on to mode B, we're now looking at STEM and remember STEM, we're going to show all of STEM's figures in dinars. And we're told that at the acquisition date, STEM had 220 million dinars worth of reserves. So that goes into our net assets total. And make sure that we are happy with our currencies, that everything in relation to Petal is dealt with in dollars and everything in relation to STEM is dealt with in dinars. So I'm going to put in that figure of 220 million for STEM. We know that that adds up to 495 million because we're told that in the question. So therefore there must be a fair value adjustment of 75 million dinars. So I'm going to increase my PPE as well by 75 million dinars. But because we're showing our accounts in dollars, I'm going to divide that through by the closing rate of exchange, which is 5 dinars to the dollar.
it's absolutely essential that we show our currencies consistently as we go through the question. We've got the fair value of the NCI as well, so that can be put into our goodwill calculation and our NCI calculation. The remainder of the information in note B is the information that we've used in answering part A of the question. The exchange rates we've been dealing with to date, we're not going to use the average rate as such, but the opening and closing rates are important. We've now got some sundry notes which aren't necessarily focused on properties, although note C is. Um, so we need to work out what's happening in respect of this property. Notice that here it's Rose that's using the property. But what we've also got to do in respect of goodwill is that we've got to restate the cost of the investment. Excuse me. We were told it was $46 million. $46 million was at the acquisition date when there were six dinars to the dollar, which gives us 276 million dinars, which we then recalculate using the closing rate to get to a figure of 55.2. So therefore, the value of the investment, the cost of the investment in dollars has increased due to the movement in the exchange rate from 46 million to 55.2, which is an increase of $9.2 million. That gets added to retained earnings. You could put that through, could add that to OCE. It's one of those things which is never really clear, uh, but you wouldn't be penalised for it. Let's now get back to note C. And here we're looking at the position of the parent company. And the parent company has bought a property. That property is being depreciated over 20 years, but we've then gone ahead and revalued it. Now, because we've revalued it, we're going to have to use the closing rate of exchange. So I'm going to set up a new working for the overseas property. And I'm going to have separate columns for dinars and dollars. So the property was purchased 12 months ago at a cost of 30 million dinars. So 12 months ago there were 6 dinars to the dollar. So therefore we would have initially put this into our accounts at a cost of 5 million dollars. We're depreciating over a period of 20 years. And we're going to focus on the depreciation charge in the SFP. I appreciate that in the income statement we would have charged depreciation using an average rate, but we're not worried about that here because we're focusing on the SFP. So it's got 1.5 million dinars, or 1 20th of 5 million gives us 0.25 million dollars. So we've got a carrying amount before revaluation of 28.5 million dinars or 4.75 million dollars. We're revaluing the asset to 35 million dinars. So we need to reflect that revaluation. So if I put through the revaluation, it's 35 million dollars. And we're going to show that using the closing rate of exchange of 5 dinars to the dollar. So that gives us a dollar value for the asset of $7 million. So the asset has increased in value by $2.25 million. So I'm going to treat that as my revaluation surplus and therefore debit PPE by $2.25 million and credit my revaluation surplus. The revaluation surplus appears in OCI as far as our statement of 
profit or loss is concerned, and OCI flows through into OCE. So I'm going to put that through into working number five and the face of my SFP. So down to working number five here. And we've got our property revaluation. And because it's not appearing in our income statement as such, or a statement of profit or loss, that 2.25 flows through from OCI into OCE in our reserve section. Note D is in respect of a bonus scheme. And, and this is quite tricky. There's an awful lot going on. Um, very few students answered this correctly when this exam was sat and it's perfectly understandable it wasn't an easy issue to deal with but notice it's a cumulative bonus so we're going to work out the total bonus over the five-year period and we're then going to spread the bonus equally over the period in which it's earned this is a classic example of applying the accruals principle so our salary is 40 million the bonus is two percent so the bonus which has been earned in year one works out as 0.8 million dollars. But it says in the question that the bonus or rather the salary is going to increase by 5% a year. So therefore our bonus is going to increase by 5% each year as well. So we work out those increases gives us figures of 0.84. How many decimal places you choose to do this is your decision. If you want to go to three decimal places or four, that's fine. Um, personally, I try to never go beyond sort of two or three. And you simply increase the bonus by 5% per year. So we do that, the total bonus comes out as 4.42 million, but I then need to spread that bonus evenly over the five year period in which it's going to be earned. So we do that as a calculation. And that works out as 0.88 million per year but because the bonus isn't going to be paid for five years, we need to discount it. Now we're currently at the end of year one. So we've been asked to discount at 8%, but we're only going to discount for four years because it's four years before we pay out that bonus. So if you discount by 1.08 to the power four, it gives us a figure of 0.65 million. So we're going to create a provision for this and because it's not going to be paid out for four years that provision is going to appear in non-current liabilities. So we're going to debit the income statement and credit non-current liabilities with 0.65 million. Now the income statement flows through into retained earnings so that's going to affect working number five and the provision is going to be in non-current liabilities so we're simply going to take that directly to our statement of financial position. So reduce group profits by 0.65 and increase non-current liabilities by 0.65. So that's note D dealt with. Note E, and this is an F7 topic. This is changing the residual value of an asset. And you only do this on a prospective basis, on a basis of doing your calculations going forwards. So what we need to do, first of all, is to determine our carrying amount of the PPE at the start of the year.
to the cost of the asset is 20 million. Our annual depreciation is cost less residual value divided by the useful life of the asset. The useful life is six years. So our annual depreciation charge is 3.1. Multiply that by three years because we've owned the asset for three years at the start of X7. So that's a total accumulated depreciation charge of 9.3. Therefore, the carrying amount of the asset at the start of the year is 10.7. We now need to work out our depreciation for the current year. And that's going to be the carrying amount of the asset less the new carrying less the new residual value of 2.6 and we have three years remaining so our depreciation is going to decrease from 3.1 to 2.7 million now if we take a look at the question it appears that the company has already charged 3.1 million of depreciation. So we need to now say that the depreciation figure should be 2.7. So we're only going to adjust for the decrease in the depreciation charge. So the depreciation charge has decreased from 3.1 million to 2.7 million. which is a reduction of 0.4. And it's just this reduction that we're going to show in our accounts. So if I'm reducing depreciation, I'm increasing the value of the asset. So I'm going to debit PPE, 0.4 million. And because we're going to decrease depreciation in the income statement, that's going to increase profits. So I'm going to go to working number five, and I'm going to increase retained earnings, which of course flow through into profits, by 0.4. Now, the figure of 8 million that we've got for the asset is of no particular relevance because that's included in the figure of 480 million that Rose already has for its group assets. So we're only going to adjust for the movement in the depreciation charge itself. Okay, so don't worry about that figure of 8 million. It's already been taken account of in the question. So our adjustment was simply debit PPE with the increase of 0.4 and credit the income statement. So we've now dealt with all of the information in the question. The question tells us to ignore deferred tax, so we can have, not that many of us would have thought about deferred tax, I must confess I never did that. And once we've dealt with all the information in the question, always go back to working number two. So there's no further impact on retained earnings. We go to working number two and we're now going to work out our totals. So acquisition, net assets are 124 at the SFP date, they're 131. And we're going to split the increase between the movement in OCE, and OCE has moved from 3 to 4, so that's an increase of 1. And the balance of the increase, so if the increase is 7, and one of that's due to movements in OCE, then the balance of 6 must be due to movements in retained earnings. 
we've got a figure of 575 for STEM, so therefore STEM's net assets have increased by 80 million dinars. We can now work out goodwill. For Petal, we pick up from working number two that the net assets at acquisition were 124. This gives us a goodwill figure of $16 million. As far as STEM is concerned, things are a little bit more complicated. The net assets at the acquisition date were 495, so therefore our goodwill figure can be calculated in dinars. And it's 31 million. But we need to convert that into dollars for the purposes of putting into our statement of financial position. All assets and liabilities, including goodwill, are translated using the closing rate of exchange. So if I take 31 million and divide that by 5, that gives me a figure of $6.2 million. So my goodwill total is going to be 16 million for Petal and 6.2 million for STEM, giving us a grand total of 22.2 million. And that's come from our goodwill working, working number three. Having dealt with goodwill, we can now turn our attention to the NCI. We've got the figures at acquisition. We can give them their share since acquisition. And for Petal, it's going to be 30%. We not, don't need to distinguish between OCE and retained earnings. Overall, net assets have increased by 7, so it's going to be 30% of that 7. That gives us a figure of 2.1. So therefore, at the SFP date, We've got a figure for the NCI of STEM of 48.1 million, but it is at this date that the NCI sell 10% of STEM, so of Petal, to Rose. So we need to work out our disposal. They had net assets worth 48.1 million. They have sold 10% of those assets out of their 30% holding, so that's one third of their investment they've made a sale of. So that works out as 16.03 million. And I can also put that into my working number six, where we've got the increased investment in Petal. We bought the shares from the NCI, so I'm going to debit the NCI with that figure of 16.03. And therefore, I'm going to debit reserves, and we normally take this to OCE with the balancing figure of 2.97 million. Because that's a debit to OCE, when we get to working number five, we're going to show this as a deduction, as a subtraction. to our NCI adjustment from working number 6, 2.97 minus. We can now go back to the NCI, and we've got our total for Petal, 32.07. For STEM, we're going to give the NCI their share, and their share is 48% of the post-acquisition profits of STEM, which are 80 million dinars. That gives us 38.4. Divide that by our closing rate of exchange, because we need to convert everything into dollars. And 
and there's a figure of 57.68. Put in our two totals for the NCI gives us a grand total of 89.75. Having worked out the NCI, we can now turn our attention to group reserves. And we can add in the parent share of the post acquisition profits. But we need to split these where necessary between retained earnings and the OCE. So for Petal, it's going to be 70%. Retained earnings have increased by 6. OCE has increased by 1. So that gives us figures of 4.2 and 0 0.7 respectively. As far as STEM is concerned, we've got 52%. The post-acquisition profits are 80, but we need to convert those into dollars using the closing rate of 5. So it's going to be 50% of 80 divided by 5. And that gets added to retained earnings. We can now work out our totals for retained earnings. 277.47. And we do this exactly the same for OCE, but only do this in the exam if you've got enough time. So we've got two totals to slot in now to the face of our statement of financial position. So let's take these totals up. Looks like I've forgotten to put in a line for OCE. I'll put that in now. So retained earnings total, an extra line for OCE. This is why I always encourage you to, to leave space between lines just in case you leave something out. It's a lot easier to review and mark if you've created the space in advance. We're now just going to do some housekeeping, add up our totals for non-current liabilities and we can work out our SFP total. I wouldn't normally do this in an exam, of course. I acknowledge the fact that the chances are I've made at least one mistake, but we've got a figure of 944.85. Let's now take a look at our assets. So we go up to the other side of the balance sheet. We've still got to put in a figure for PPE, 603. 0.65. Work out our total. This is the, the knees trembling, eyes closed part of the question. And it looks like we've had a lucky day and that balances like so.